Welcome to the Prog Talks by the Prog Space. Welcome to the Prog Talks, an interview series by the Prog Space where we will be talking to musicians in all corners of the progressive music scene. Welcome back to another episode of the Prog Talks. I'm your host Dario and as always before we jump into to today's topic and uh, welcome today's guest, don't forget to get us a cup of tea or coffee or get our uh, nice mug in our uh, merch store uh, helps us out a lot uh, to keep doing what we're doing here. And uh, now, uh, please welcome from the United States, Neil from the band or project Dirt Poor Robins. Uh, Neil, it's a pleasure to talk to you uh, to today and tonight here in, in Munich. It's already 10 p.m. Oh, wow. And, uh, <laughs> It, it it is a like dirt pool robins is a very very like like one of the biggest surprises for me in the latest years i've never heard about dirt pool robins before last week so welcome neil to the prog talks <laughs> oh i'm so like this is such a delight to be talking on a prog channel um i just i don't get to talk through that lens enough I consider it a big aspect of what we do. So I'm. So I apologize if you haven't heard of us. We don't really market ourselves. Our audience, our, our entire strategy is almost dependent on people sharing uh, our music. So luckily, it's grown over the last decade to the point where we've been doing this full time for the last four years without having to tour. So uh, you know, I, I, yeah, it's my fault. People who like Prague haven't heard of us because I've done nothing to push it into that world. Uh, so here we go. Maybe a few people, a few more people will hear about it today. Uh, thanks to you. Now that, that that time is over. Now, seriously, I I, um, I stumbled across uh, the your new album, uh, which is Queen of the Night, the soundtrack to the movie. Um, right. Like uh, the other week, uh, where uh, I was uh, compiling the 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 playlist uh, for our releases of the week and uh, of course i know about certain releases from from uh bands that are established or that i knew before and i will write some highlights some some mini reviews about highlights about bands and 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 um albums that i i, I know beforehand that would be out and and i know that that, that are cool but then I, then i stumbled across this uh crazy album called queen of the night and and i just had to to write a a talk <laughs> mini review about that as well and and then i then i found out about uh dirt pool robbins so for the for the whole of the pro community can you just give a, give us a brief uh rundown where you're coming from and 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 what dirt pool robbins is all about yeah okay so my roots are very prog in the sense that my favorite albums were almost always 100 at least concept records i grew up on uh i, I grew up you know beetle sergeant peppers was one of the first one that came on my radar pink floyd the wall um, pretty much every Yes album as a kid, I really loved. Uh, and moving on through that, I mean, there even been concept records through the 80s, like Queensryche had this record, Operation Mind Crime, and which is an underrated record from the 80s if you haven't heard it. Uh, OK Computer by uh, Radiohead. All these records were just the thing that I I lived by. I love the fact that there was this backstory to it, like that that, and it was you didn't really know the story wasn't tamed in the sense that they gave it to you so explicitly that you knew exactly what was going on, but you got the sense there was this context, and I and I knew that as soon as I got into making records, that's exactly what I was going to do. Now I might, um, you know, I might say that uh, one of the differences with us is that we definitely lean into the cinematic side of of that kind of record we don't necessarily sound always like a rock band and or bands like yes like we have songs where that, that we're 
it would require a lot of technical proficiency for musicians to play it or learn it. But that's not really our focus. Our focus is more on uh, uh, bands like Queen and the Beatles, where they had these elaborate productions and the expertise was going more into the overall production of it more than the like, oh, this would be really hard to play uh, kind of world. So uh, I've, we've always been composition focused as a prog band. And so we've evaded that label a lot of the times, even though really I see that as what we're doing. Um, people don't see it as that because uh, we're not necessarily a band's band, which is one of the the, the pitfalls of uh, <laughs> doing prog rock sometimes is that bands love you and the rest of the general public is left scratching their head. So uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. But uh, like k- kind of going from that, you're, you're, you're also not, not really a band band as in you have like four or five members. No, I right? play everything. Yeah. Now. So uh, Queen, if you listen to the Queen of Night soundtrack, that's all me, all the composition or the or orchestral stuff. Uh, it takes forever to do it one track at a time, but uh I have a cello in the background. That's not my main instrument, but I do play it. I play uh, guitar would be my main instrument and uh, piano. But uh, yeah, so it's my wife and myself. So she she's the female vocalist. And we actually met. We were both cast on opposite coast in America for to play leads in a musical together. So we were cast because they thought we would go good together. And apparently we did. And we've been married ever since. So that was, uh, that was like 18 years ago, right? Yeah, a little bit longer. I don't want to say how old I am. I, I did go prematurely gray, so don't uh, <laughs> don't judge me. So um, the thing is, is that she is, she was such an incredibly talented musician. So I, I've worked in the studio with a lot of bands and a lot of people. And some of our stuff has odd time signatures and some difficult intervals. And she has them immediately. So she's been so easy to work with in the studio uh, for that reason. And a wonderful collaboration partner. And even when she's not doing the writing and things like that, she's she's giving me yes or no's and giving me feedback and she's got very strong opinions. And so she's been an incredible collaborator for me. And I'm not just saying that so I can, uh, you know, go to bed well at night uh, without a fight, no, but really um, she's been an incredible uh, asset to me in, in, in this project, in our project. May, 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 maybe I can jump in there uh, as a, as a listener, certainly as a first-time listener for Dirt Pooh Robbins uh, with the with the new Queen of the Night album uh, that has just been released the other week, um, the 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 production on one like on the one part and then also the the vocals that's like the quality is just really outstanding. I'm I'm really super excited to listen to it to anything that I. That I that I can get my hands on from 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 Dirt Poor Robbins now because it's 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 just just such a quality that that is uh, that that has both the like like the excitement of something new for me because I haven't heard it before but also like you know with the with the themes you're dealing conceptually as you said you 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 you're always doing like these concept concept albums. It is like it 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 has that nostalgic like you know um, vintage feel to it while being a modern production as well. But but then again, both of your voices are uh, as well really really amazing and 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 as as these um, people who cast you all all those years ago uh uh knew already the, you you really work well together yeah. as well <laughs> yeah the casting director literally cast us for that reason he's like there's going to be chemistry you guys will probably get married um so conceptually so when it, uh, you know one of the things that i growing up too i was always more fascinated like i was like i was i wasn't against like bands that were singing about chicks and just normal things in life but like i don't know i'm gonna i'm gonna say some heavy metal names here like iron maiden and ronnie james dio and these people like they seem to be tapping into something more historical or something more mythological and you know and then there were other bands like you know uh i don't know like you know radiohead with their more impressionistic lyrics and and things like that i really i didn't want to just sing about things that were universal because they were they were too simple you know i wanted to sing about things that were 
complex, but what you got to at the bottom of the uh, at the end of the day was something that was a universal. So these, you know, a lot of Greek mythology we draw inspiration from in the sense that those patterns in those stories, even though they're some bizarre elements to the stories, you can actually extract a pattern from those stories that you can apply to current situations, current events, war, uh, you know, love relationships, narcissism, all these different categories of life. Um, so a lot of ancient stories, a lot of ancient thinking, we really use a lot of symbolism. Uh, it happens naturally. It's not something we try to infuse in the music. It's just kind of how we, we, we see the world and how we look out the window. Um, so those things um, uh, really find their way into our music. And also like, we just uh, we try to have our pulse on like what what's really going on in the world. So our, our record before this was called Dead Horse. I don't know if you've seen that or came across that yet. So Dead Horse worked out very well for us in the sense that I think it was 2018 and I was uh, or 2017 is when I came up with a story for it. And we were trying to rent an Airbnb in Florida and a red tide had come in and nobody could occupy the town we were going to. It was like there was dead fish everywhere and stuff. So I was like, oh, I got to cancel this trip. So I was trying to look up to see uh, if there was a cancellation policy due to some kind of event like this on Airbnb. And I started researching pandemics. So I was like, oh, pandemics. So this is crazy. I started when I started to get concerned when I started researching pandemics because I was like, oh, man, like if anything happened, we are so we're so soft and and so and we're so prepared for this. We're vulnerable and we, we, we had, we're a safety first culture this could really mess things up and as someone who has kids and this was concerning to me so i kind of dreamt up the story of like a world that was kind of riddled and locked down by pandemics and then technology was starting to replace our normal uh social interactions and so lo and behold we started releasing this record like we do most of our records in in chunks so people don't have to wait as long so they get content uh, if you want to look at it that way so I, I i did it in chapters where we do records in acts and you know we had already gotten two-thirds of the way through the record by the time the pandemic hit in 2020 so we had these songs that just seemed very like prophetic in a way um and so that uh something similar is happening with our, our current project with queen of the night uh, i wrote the story in 2020 and like so many of the headlines and like aspects of the film that we've released episodically have just come to tr- come true in the press like our main character seems to be some sort of uh technocrat like an elon musk and even following a lot of the pattern of Elon Musk in the sense that there's been, uh, you know, he, the, our main character, you know, takes, he's, he, he works with electricity, transportation, he's trying to get to the moon. He's also, it's done in 1920s style. So it's got this kind of steampunk, uh, you know, black and white feel to it. And uh, he also takes out the largest personal loan in the history of the world. These are all things Elon Musk ended up doing after the episodes came out. And that was really weird to us. So I don't know. I think that there's... Um, I think there's something uh, maybe maybe some musicians can do this, but in the sense that like a lot of your ideas you have come from like an answer to a problem you've been ruminating. And it, some of that might have to do with the zeitgeist, just where the culture's at and things that might trouble you as an artist or a reflective person when you see a culture that's starting to become more and more zombie like and more and more uh, with a shorter intention span. And they seem to be responding more like robots to their personal positions and ideologies. Um you know, you reflect on these things and suddenly a story idea comes to you and you don't know where it came from. And then, you know, it ends up being a movie. So making a movie this time was like a natural extension of what we were already doing. I felt like this particular story, it was going to not do it service to just have it as this kind of background element to our record. I really felt like I needed to put a visual to it and put the story on the screen because the story is heavily symbolic as well. So some of these some of these elements are even though the story spelled out, like I showed everything I wanted people to see people aren't i don't think you're going to be able to put together the meaning of what's really happening in the story and how it relates to your own inner workings and how it relates to our culture at large um right away so that's one of the things we try to do is you try to take an audience on a journey with us and hopefully we open a window into an idea that doesn't reduce the idea to something too small but hopefully it opens your imagination um you know to have some uh, some more wonder and awe in regards to these things Wonderful, absolutely. I have to uh, say, um, I I just told you off the record be- be- before we went on air, so to speak, that I that I just watched the Queen of the Night movie, and uh, yeah, it's 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 quite a trip, but it's different to the album, and um, so the uh, of course the the art of doing. A, con- a a concept album as a musician as a songwriter as a composer 
is different to to writing and 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 shooting a movie even though it's like largely a silent movie <laughs> um uh, so maybe maybe we we we're going to start with the music as we as we're um, first and foremost of course we're we're a music podcast and we're talking about music here um for, for the the first time i heard the Pooh robbins music i had the feeling it's it's like uh yeah the deer hunter went full uh cabaret and uh, all, uh d d down this road uh without caring about rock at all like just just doing this shit you know <laughs> yeah no it's right well so it's funny because i really actually i didn't i didn't never heard of the deer hunter until 2017 and i thought like because someone was like someone posted a thing on reddit it was like oh look at this they're ripping you off in this song <laughs> And I went and listened to Deer Hunter. I'm like, there's no way these guys are ripping me off. Like, I mean, I understood the similarities in the two songs, but that's that happens in music um, because their depth and their creativity and their and their strength of their concepts were they're not the kind of people that need to <laughs> rip people off at all. So I was like, this is uh, this is butt kiss. But I looked it up and it was so funny because like when Kate, my wife and I started Dirt Poor Robbins was the same year in the same city Dirt, uh, the Deer Hunter started. Which wow. there must have been something in the water going on then. Uh, you know, I've never talked to those guys in person yet. I know they know who we are. And uh, but I just thought that was so weird when I went back and found that out that we were both like in Providence, Rhode Island. And like around 2004, we're recording our first records and we're playing out. I We'd never overlapped with them, never saw them, never heard of them while I was there. I moved out of Rhode Island the year after that. Um, but uh, I thought that was so weird. I'm glad you brought them up though. There, that's a, that's a really great band. And I, and I get why I don't think we really sound too much like them or they sound too much like us, but I get why someone who would like them would like us. That makes perfect sense to me when someone tells me they're a deer hunter fan. And yeah. Guess, for, 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 for me is like, I'm not too familiar with the deer hunter. I have to admit, but everything I heard of them is great, great stuff, great music. But they do have these uh, odd songs or odd parts that are going into this more, you know, cabaret um, direction that is that is kind of more prominent in in, in Dirt Pool Robbins uh, as a whole. Um, now, w what I found really interesting in like listening to the album and then then uh, watching the movie, um, how how much uh, how much of the the music on the album is in the movie and vice versa. <laughs> oh, okay, great. So you, so you came along late to the party a little bit. So <laughs> yeah, we, I did. <laughs> no, it's oh, it is, it's great. That's great. I love talking about this. Um, so again, so when I shot the film in 2021 in the spring. I'm using my own kids. My my wife plays the queen in the movie. I don't want to give away too many spoilers. Um, but uh, so she's, you know, the singer in the band. And I used all my friends. Like I have a couple of friends that are real actors and I have a bunch of friends that are just they're not afraid to try something. And with, with a silent film, it's not necessarily a modern style of acting like you're we are trying to bridge the gap between a modern movie and that era in the sense of that era people. I don't know if it was because the screens were fuzzier or whatever, but their actions would be more like they were trying to indicate what they were feeling more than they were trying to get those subtleties of facial movement and stuff. Everything was exaggerated. So we went for that in the film and uh, but try not try to do it in a way that it didn't take away from the emotionality of, of scenes. So um, anyway, we're making. Um, you know, it's the, one of the problems of being a musician is like 30 things come into my head to say at any time. So I kind of lose my place at times. Um, but uh, getting back around to the film. So uh, we decided to make this film and we knew that if we did a silent film, we'd be able to lay our music right over it. Right. And so if there's a song with lyrics, it's not necessarily we try to avoid the parts where there's like a, a title card and someone's having dialogue and having lyrics at the same time at that, because I don't want you listening to a lyric and reading that. But at the same time, we could kind of go wall to wall with music. So uh, because we released episodically, there were credits for each episode. And I wrote I wrote it like a B-side that had to do with some backstory of it for the credits. So there are a bunch of songs on the soundtrack that will not appear in the film, about half of them. And so if you're like, where are these songs coming from? I didn't see these in the film. That's where they came from. They came from the individual episodes that, that are no longer online and the credit scenes in those episodes. So um, we have not released the score. So I did the score as well. So I directed, wrote, 
um, and scored the film. And uh, the scoring was great because, like, there's all kinds of things you get to do that you just it has no place on a normal record. You know, some more uh, impressionistic stuff for the musicians out there using whole tone scales. Um, you know, half half whole scales is what we call in America too. These other scales that really don't point in such a strong direction like we're used to in Western music. Um, in some moments, I don't want to give, again, I don't want to spoil things, but there's some moments where I went completely arrhythmic, atonal. And uh, and so that was fun, but getting to do callbacks of themes that you don't get to do as much on records because it feels too repetitive in a record. But in a film, when you do a callback to another theme you've already brought in, it reminds you of that previous scene and connects those two moments like a bridge. So I had a blast doing that. And, uh, you know, I had a specific size orchestra in mind when I started but that but one of the things you'll notice if you watch the film like the skies and the in the environments become slightly more realistic and less less um less expressionistic as the movie goes along and so does the orchestral music where it goes from more of this handmade smaller orchestra sound where it gets bigger and bigger with more voices and a larger and larger group so uh that was all intended from the very beginning um but that's kind of yeah. So that soundtrack and the and the differences between the soundtrack and the actual score of the film. That's the differences. We have not put the score out as a recording yet. I don't know if we will. Depends on what uh, we just follow. What people ask us for stuff, we're like, okay, we'll do that. And uh, you know, if enough people ask, we end up doing things. So if like people come around and keep begging us for vinyl, we'll eventually put this one on vinyl, like we did the last one. Uh, it's a pain in the butt. It's expensive, but you know, if there's enough people, it, it pays off. So uh, we want to give them what they're asking for. This is uh, as a band. It's not just we're not just making music to make ourselves happy. There's a, this kind of like this romance you have with your audience, where you're trying to do things that make them happy too, and that make you happy at the same time. And hopefully, if you've drawn people to yourself that are a little bit like you, it's not going to be very hard to do. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Uh... Uh, I, I've got uh, two two very different questions here um, uh, concerning the music part and the and the movie part. So concerning the the music part, you 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 mentioned the orchestration and the orchestrations getting bigger as the movie goes along or as the story goes along, and yeah. and all that. Um, and and you previously you you already mentioned that you like also play. Different instruments, you're a multi instrumentalist and all that. But is the all the orchestration on on the on the soundtrack and on the album is that all you or did you also use like like some 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 software and and uh, yeah like, you know. right. <laughs> Both. It's a hybrid approach. So there's a yeah, thing that okay. happened. Uh, so I remember I learned this when I was watching when Lord of the Rings came out on DVD. They had these wonderful behind the scenes like. And I know about, about Prague fans probably watch these. I went to Lord of the Rings College with Peter Jackson, basically, and he's telling you how they did the effects. And one of the things, this was an Alfred Hitchcock trick that he kind of took. And like, so the movie The Birds, they have these scenes where there's all these birds at this playground. And Alfred Hitchcock's like, there's no, in whatever, the 1960s, whenever they shot that, or 50s, uh, there's no way to get that many birds on set behaving. Like, you're not going to tie these poor little birds' feet to the, uh, you know, things and then <laughs> to have a hundred birds and make someone do that. So they would put a bunch of fake birds with a few real birds in there. And so that's always been our, our approach to large orchestrations because it's like, okay, so uh, there's a violinist we use. Um, I used to use in the past and we would do that. I would write all of the parts. I would uh, pull out my samples. I would get the samples just right. And then I would have her come and lay over the real violinist stuff. And by the time we were done, it just, it totally, we were both fooled by it. And if we were like, well, if we can fool us, this is going to fool an audience. And not that we're really trying to fool or trick people. You're just, you're trying to get a response from people. So whatever gets that response, like I'll take that road. So, um, with you know with part of the problem with uh with samples is that you know i've explained this to people before but like if i let's say i pull up a violin section right okay i'm gonna here comes my violin section so i've got these samples and there might be very expensive very realistic but if i hit one note with a violin orchestra like that group that's the entire section playing that note so the problem you run into now is if i start to create subdivisions in those sections which is almost necessary like at, at certain parts of the composition now you have way too many violin playing violins playing and now it starts to sound like samples right so to avoid that in general i did everything one instrument in the orchestra at a time like uh individual performances make sure i got all the articulations right uh and built the thing up and i've gotten pretty quick at it so it doesn't i can do probably three to four minutes of score 
fully orchestrated score a day performed and recorded and written. Um, so it's not that time consuming for me. Um, that's because I've done film scoring before and my gosh, they make you rush <laughs> so bad because the director keeps pushing back the date. He's going to give you the, or she is going to give you the locked off film. And that date is always way shorter period of time than you had counted on and really needed. So you end up working, you know, 16 hour days and, uh, getting good at getting, stuff done quickly <laughs> so uh that's the the orchestral stuff i do like that and I, I will like individually place the instruments in different rooms and and different spots in the room if i'm doing samples so um and then also i know how to orchestrate so it helps to know the effective ranges of the instruments the potential of the uh articulations they could make uh where things are actually should be placed in the room and then maybe how you might modify that so it sounds better in a movie um so these are all things and then even even the choral stuff this is my wife and i and sometimes my kids just layering vocals like we do um at one point we we borrow there's two spots in the film where we borrow from public domain pieces and one is a bach bach piece uh, uh Kom Yezu, and you probably you know, I don't you don't need a translation for this obviously <laughs> um so uh it, Kom Yezu, I love this piece it has all of this um coloratura it's called I left off on the end and I and I found like a, a section of it I could use that really felt like a chorus that would work now and my wife and I just went and layered layered all the baritone tenor bass uh alto soprano parts ourselves different distances from the mic so it sounded authentic we would try to modify our vocal tone so it didn't sound like the same voice layered like you know you get that effect it, it can sound a little fake and we worked our butts off to try to like we didn't because when you give even though we, this is a low budget project for us right the entire thing all in was uh sixty thousand dollars american um and uh, and it's, it, I feel like it's a pretty epic film in that sense that it, just the orchestration and the score alone would cost more than that for a feature film. Um, so, but we don't get to go and tell people who watch it at the end of the day how much it costs or that, you know, we don't get to make excuses for why it is the way it is. So we just, as a labor of love, we just take the time to do it where we feel 100% positive that we gave it our best go and we don't have to apologize for this because of time or budget. That makes sense. Absolutely, and uh, I, I I would have asked about Kam Yezu uh, later, anyways, because I I've I've been quite obsessed about this song the last week, to be honest. Oh, very cool! <laughs> yeah, it might be um, our most prog-ish thing on this record. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's very daring, and and some I would assume some Bach purists might. Uh, find it uh, a heresy or, or, or I've already heard from them. <laughs> <laughs> You're correct. I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let, let's, uh, let's, uh, hear there's two bit. schools with that though. Just to add to that, yeah. there's two yeah, schools. There are people that are just excited that someone's remembering Bach, you know, yeah. at the same time. So like when, you know, like th there's some people yeah. that are like, Oh, you didn't include the whole piece as it was an intended. You switched the key of it or whatever. They get offended. Yeah. There's other people who are like, Oh my gosh, I love that you're using Bach here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I talked to, to, to a lot of friends and, and colleagues about it the last week, actually. And, uh, of course, not of all, not all of them are, um, you know, used to prog music, uh, uh, or, or progressive approach of rock or metal or whatever and uh, but when when i tell them i don't like you know um classical music merged with pop music as you would see it in your average tv channel which is here in in germany it would be prosieben or something like 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 uh. some 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 private tv jan channel that that is like they might uh you you might hear some pop music infused with classical music that is like totally streamlined and it's horrible i i i hate it but um yeah they, they like a like a i don't know if you aware of the a swedish prog rock band called pathos with the with double a and and they have this wonderful piece called uh streams on their second album, Kalukain, and it's also um, um, like a um, uh, rendition of a Bach piece. Um, it's wonderful if it's done right in the right intention, and if it's not streamlined, it's, it's if it's 
really serves a compositional and, and purpose and and also in 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 the movie it, it serves another purpose maybe that's a that's a good uh segue to to talk about the movie a little bit as i uh, thought um the your orchestrations like as you just um uh, said you can hear it even more in the in the movie in the in the in this actual score um how well how well it works <laughs> how, how well they're Thank done <laughs> Thank you. and uh but 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 um maybe maybe to to diverge a little bit from the music and and talk a tiny little bit uh, about the 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 movie in the end uh i i was just uh, curious uh, as a as a movie um enthusiast as well uh how, how much of it was was like shot in front of a green screen and and like like how did you approach this as a uh completely low budget diy project okay uh, to, 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 to look that good yeah that's <laughs> that's a good question well let me say something quick just about what you just said before that because i think it's important for prog fans to know that they're and i'm not trying to butter you up i think i think prog fans are smarter than the average person generally it, it appeals to a higher iq group and so prog people are really confused when they show music to people and the people like just kind of glaze over. Uh, it's because you're able to, to handle more complex patterns and more complex things, and you want to be challenged in every direction. That's what's interesting to you, you know. So, uh, prog people tend to be intellectual, so they kind of miss that point. They they miss that sometimes when it comes to sharing things. And we try to, I try to bridge that gap. I try to always put something relatable in uh, because I do like. I mean, I'm a sucker for just some simple pop things sometimes too, as well as uh, you know, I want to do classical stuff. I grew up playing neoclassical music when I was real little I started playing Inve Malmsteen stuff I didn't know that I wasn't allowed I, I that was too hard to play but I thought I could and so I did and I learned it you know so it really gave me a head start not knowing that that was hard music to play I just thought it was music um so the neoclassical stuff moved on to the classical stuff and then here we are we made a movie so yeah okay so this is my first movie and I've worked on films I don't know if I can make a movie when I sit down to make a movie. I just, I, I kind of think I can. Right. And so my, I've made a living off of throwing myself in over my head into situations, playing with musicians that I had no business being in the room with. I had embarrassed myself over the years. I've also risen to the occasion. I've had it go, had wins and losses like this. And, but I grow faster when I push myself into the water that's too deep for me. And so this is exactly what happened when I made a film. So the problem is, when we're, I'm, I write this screenplay and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is a very expensive feature film I've written, but I want to make it. So how do I frame this up so I can actually pull this off? Cause I am a visual artist as well. Um, and uh, so I'm like, okay, okay. I know what I can do here. If when I look back at these old, I was just really getting to some old sound films and they had less camera movement. And of course you don't have to record audio on set. And there was this really cool expressionistic period. The German uh, silent films were my biggest inspiration, honestly. Metropolis, what came out in 1927, The Cabinet of Dr. Uh, Caligari. Um, these are incredible works of art. These, like, every frame, if you pause it, I'm shutting my phone off, it's dingy. Uh, every frame, if you pause it, it's like a painting. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is this is the kind of film I want to make. They're iconic. And so um, – I'm not a huge fan of green screen movies. I don't love the Marvel movies. I don't love the way they look. So I was going to, but I kind of had to, unless I was going to paint and hand make all of these scenes. Now we did use miniatures. Some of them are behind me. I used a lot of aquarium furniture in this, you know, for like fish aquarium furniture. So, uh, you know, just really cheap things, stuff we built. We made some costumes. Um, so we had to, we had to try, uh, we had to try it this way. So I'm like, we're going to build a massive green screen. I'm going to paint the floor green. The whole thing's going to be green. And I convinced all my friends to be in this film. I showed them the script. Everybody seemed to love the script, but they had no idea what this was going to look like. God bless them. I thank them for that because I could have really embarrassed them. This could have really been embarrassing looking when they were they had no clue if i could pull it off or not but i convinced them that i could and then my friend pete mitchell pete mitchell worked for jim henson for a while and he's a great visual artist we've been making movies together and music together since uh middle school and so we used to run around with vhs cameras and make kung fu movies when we were young and we we pulled off some really cool visual effects with like just 
with through trickery and, and almost like, you know, this David Copperfield kind of illusionary approach to it. So I pulled out every trick I'd learned, everything I'd seen over the years. Uh, we handmade. I got I got a couple of artists to help me with some of the design. There is some 3D um, aspects of the film, like the, the the Graves Tower. There's a flying Zeppelin that looks like a Capricorn. There's a rocket in the film. These were actual 3D elements. Uh, everything else is pretty much two dimensional things that I actually just painted, hand painted in Photoshop or went and took uh, went and took pictures. I live near a town called St. Augustine, which is the oldest town in America, it's Spanish colonial. And there's some incredible, incredible buildings there. So I went and shot like we went and shot those locations with my friend TJ and composite all together. And I was really a stickler about the composites. Like I, I wanted it to feel like they were on set and we took a lot of care to make sure that the lighting on the sets we built matched the lighting in the room. And that when we were filming on the green screen, we, we, every shot there was, there was lighting directions and here's where the lights are coming from. Here's how many are in the room. So everything would gel later. And so it kind of ends up, I think it, I was, I was happier with the result that I thought I could do in the sense that I felt like a black and white version of like a Maxfield Parrish painting at times. Like, I don't know if you're familiar with that artist, um, but if from the, he's from the same era uh, where like the skies and the backgrounds are kind of dreamy, but the characters are realistic in the foreground. And I thought Pete did a wonderful job with, uh, with his, his part of the job as far as compositing and making these things blend and go together that were shot at different times. And, uh, so I, I couldn't have been happier, but I mean, you be the judge, who, whoever you're at home, you see it. Tell me if, how we did. I, I did. We did most of it myself. I didn't uh, know that could be done. So. I, 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 I do hope uh, I will get to 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 watch uh, the film again with with some friends just to hear mm. what they think. Um both well, of the film. My fi wife and uh, I want to go on tour with it. We want to go and do some music with the two of us and show the film. And uh, oh. well, all, all the actors are like singers and musicians. So there's a couple of them I want to bring, but we might come to Germany. Uh, it's a long wow. shot, but Wonderful. one of our biggest cities is Berlin. Um, and uh, Munich is up there too. They're both in our top 20 as far as uh, fan base. So it might be worth it. We, you know, we got a couple thousand people in the city. I, I, th I think we, we should keep in touch about that. Um, uh, what now, what, what did I want to ask? Um, Oh yeah, how how long did it take from from like the first spark of inspiration till the completion of the movie? Okay, so it was end of 2020 um and we we kind of fled the state I lived in in America. We went to Florida. Uh I took my family cuz we had a homeschool cuz the schools were locked down. And so I took my whole family, I have four kids and my wife and we brought their books and we just went and like kind of world schooled. We just we traveled to places that we could actually do things. And so they weren't stuck in a house and uh, Florida in America for better or for worse was really open. Uh, it was kind of surprising when we got down there, but uh, we had a great time. And so I was down there, like I had had this, the prologue to the story, the very first scene uh, with a little boy and a little mm -hmm. girl oh, played by two of my children. Um, I had that scene came into my head. So I, I called my friend, Jonathan Peugeot. I don't know if you know who he is. He's uh, like, like kind of the, the guy for symbolism in the world right now, I think I would say. Uh, and we, I talked about it. I was like, Hey man, I want to bring you in because um, I don't want to, I don't want to dissect my own story, <laughs> but I want to get the symbolism right. Right. Like I feel like it's right, but I want this to the symbolism to, to be in every aspect of the story. So I brought him in and he was like, oh, I really like this. And he kept adding, he kept adding and adding and adding um, some dollar thoughts so I could really make the movie four dimensional. So there's like an Easter egg in every direct direction. If you want to check it out, even character names, place names, um, objects in the room. Uh, every object was because we have to put every object on the set, every object we chose for a purpose that helped tell a different aspect of the story. So that's what we did in the end of 2020. So in 20 uh, January 2021, I wrote the script screenplay It was my first screenplay I'd written. And uh, we started casting. And I just was talking mostly talking my friends in I got mostly yeses, which was great. Uh, Tiffany Montgomery, who was in it was really the only person who was out there working constantly she plays the character named freya who's oliver's assistant she's a wonderful actress um so we did all the casting uh we get together i i found uh like a strip mall in a strip mall they call that in america i don't know if they call that that in germany but it's just basically a bunch of shops in a row and there was one that was empty that they couldn't rent out and i was like hey i'll rent that for you for a month that's better than no money how cheap can i get it for we took it over we put up the green screen 
Uh, the set on um, being on set was awesome because we could crank music. We could be loud. It was a silent film. There was a lot of laughing. It was like a constant party. And a lot of people hadn't been together in person in a while. So it really was like this extra fun, like environment. And, um, so in my style as a director, I was trying to keep flow state going, meaning I didn't want to be so particular with the actors that they had to overthink. So I wanted to give them enough general direction and then see what they gave me back. And then hopefully if we had enough positive energy and people weren't second guessing themselves and they were willing to go for it, we would get better takes than we could imagine. And that seemed to work. Uh, so we spent about two weeks, two and a half weeks actually shooting it, went back, edited it, and then you know, then Pete and I split up the jobs. I was like, okay, you're going to have to do, take the green screen out of all these shots. That, uh, Cause I had ed edited the film already without doing the music, which was kind of a bad idea, but I had to edit it first so we could get started on the visual effects. And so all that music was recorded after even the songs, when they line up, it's a miracle. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so anyway, it, we spent uh, up until that fall of 2021 is when we released the first episode. So I realized that it was going to take too long to make it. And people were going to be waiting too long for music because people want content. And so we started releasing it in chapters. There were five episodes. And uh, so when the final film was done and went off to a film festival, that was in September of 2022. So we it took almost two years. And so I've got the same plan for my next film. We're doing this werewolf film, but this one's going to be a talkie, <laughs> you know, so we're going through, we're going through the uh, time. It's going to be in color and it's going to be a talkie. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and and uh, but I know how long it's going to take. And it, this one's not going to have green screens, uh, but I'm still giving myself two years to make the film. So from the point we started already uh, to the point where it's finished, just, uh, I'm aiming for it to come out Halloween 2024. Good luck with that. I'm really looking forward to it. Maybe to tie it, 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 tying all this in with the endeavor that is Dirtpool Robbins as a uh, artistic outlet, and uh, also as much as I gathered, it's your main job. It's what I do. I don't do anything else anymore. No, <laughs> right. So, yeah. uh, so when you when when you said people want content, you you're probably also talking about your patron, and 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 so 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 I'm curious how how uh, w when did you start with your patron campaign, and and how much has it helped you? I mean, probably as a not playing live band, it was not that much of a difference during the pandemic, but maybe. With, no, with, yeah, with, yeah. with like with like an extra effort like doing a like a feature film um to have a like an established patreon community um that is really supportive um it might have been a like a great uh thing to to have them back you up while you're doing this new while you're departing on this new endeavor you know <laughs> oh my gosh the people that interact with us and actually move in to talk with us and like you know whatever join our inner circles all the way down to our discord server um they're the they're the most encouraging people ever like they're just they i feel like they're just like us or i feel like they're almost all of them are people we would hang out with in real life um but uh they're super supportive um they share. I mean, that's the reason we we're, the movie's got 20,000 views in two weeks. I'm excited. I'm so psyched about that because, I mean, we're not we don't know how to push it out there. We don't have the money to buy expensive ads and expensive ad campaigns. So it's people sharing it virally and it and it goes well. And so, the you know, the record got about 200,000 streams in the first two weeks as well. So, I mean, we couldn't be happier with that. And that's all on our people. So with Patreon, I launched a Patreon for the specific purpose of funding myself while I made the movie. So I couldn't be doing anything else for money. So I, I just let them know. And we, and when we opened it, it was like, this is the way to get physical copies of our stuff. So people would come to the Patreon to get the vinyl. So we have dead horse. I think I have one behind me on vinyl. Those are all gone now. Uh, thanks to the Patreon people, but, uh, except so, for the one oh, behind you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Except for the one, I got to keep one for me. You know what I mean? I actually have more than like more. I have like 10, but, um, Anyway, the uh, so we just basically were like, hey, here it is. And then we gave people private access. Some people want artistic consulting or they just want to hang out and talk. So we had tiers of Patreon for that. The problem was it was like I don't I didn't think I could make music and all these other things I wanted to do in that be a sustainable model. So that was something we kept for a short time. I left the Patreon open and I told everybody we're leaving it open. If you want to keep helping us like 
you know, not worry about money and move on. You can keep giving us, but you know, by all means, don't, don't hurt yourself to give us money. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're not that desperate, but we need the money too, to go on. So we sell t-shirts and physical copies of things. Those do well. Our streaming money keeps going up. So that's kind of supporting us too. So, um, you know, you we did it that way. You, you, you do Christmas t-shirts. <laughs> no, I know I did. I I will do anything. Uh, I will do. I will. I will humiliate myself for the the sake of keeping getting to do this. I love getting up in the morning and working on this. I love the relationship we have with our audience, and uh, I have uh, the problem is uh, I don't have less stories to tell. I have more things I want to tell, so I'm just releasing stuff faster and faster. So while I'm working on this next movie, I've got a new record coming out in the spring. Uh, this one's going to be a little more hard hitting for people who like hard hitting stuff. I, I, I don't uh, think that's a problem at all. <laughs> just, no, just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Queen of the Night's probably as soft as we get, even though it has a lot of energy. That's probably as like like um, you know laid back of a record as we were ever going to make. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just I played on I played guitar on another project this year, and I got to shred on that record. And I was like, I'm definitely like it was. I'd already made a decision, <laughs> but I was like, I'm definitely going to be tearing it up a little bit more on this next record. So it's going to be a more guitar driven record. It fits the theme of the of it. It's another dystopian sort of story from us. You're welcome. And uh and so we're going to we're going to release that, you know, like in halves. We're going to release half in the spring, half in the in the fall, and then I am going to do a Christmas record next year. Uh this now this one might be fully orchestral with a choir. Um yeah, wow. I have some great friends that are in a choir. So I want it to be a proper Christmas record. I want it to feel like christmas when you put it on i don't it's not going to be about santa and crap like that i'm actually i actually want to conceptually dive into the actual nativity story and look at the symbolism of that story um you know i think that there's uh, there's some really really powerful things to say in christmas that we kind of miss we get we get stuck in these gift giving kind of stories and that's fine i think they're cute i watch them <laughs> watch them with my kids but i mean there's there could be some like there there there's a there's a mystery at uh, in christmas that i want to explore in the record so um yeah wonderful i think that uh we went way over the time that we had actually planned but i i I, 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 I love it it uh, I lo it it was very very uh interesting uh everything you had to say about uh dirt poor robins uh very very um intriguing project uh and and uh, artistic project in 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 every sense um And and what you just said, I think, uh, ties in very very well with our um, yeah traditional last words here on the um, prog talks. Because if you guys out there want to keep up to date with Dirt Poor Robins, you have to follow all of their socials uh, to keep up the date. And and we we're gonna put them in the like everywhere, you know, in the description of the of the of the video and everything um and also don't forget to follow us if you haven't done so already the prog space on facebook instagram twitter youtube you know it and um yeah neil it was such a pleasure talking to you thank you so much for taking your time and you. um yeah you guys out there go listen to uh queen of the night and watch it on youtube it's really cool uh until next time this uh, this might have been the 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 second to last episode of the year uh but uh hopefully we've got a really cool episode to close this year off uh coming the the week after um but until then uh keep uh um yeah uh, uh Wait, now, now I've uh, lost my train it. of. I, I, I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> <laughs> take care of yourselves and your loved ones, and keep uh, spreading the prog love. The prog talks produced by the prog space. <laughs>